seen data from that health all week. Um, I, it is one of the landmark studies in collecting network data on a large population base across lots of different settings. And um, in addition to being scientifically a, you know, a remarkable landmark study, it was also one of the first ones to bump headlong into the ethical challenges that come with collecting these kinds of data. And so um, what Kathy's going to do today is describe a little bit about health, some of the unique features of the design. And from that, um, uh, we're going to use that to launch into a discussion of ethical issues with network data that are um, uh, both specific to ad health, but quite frankly, much more general in terms of the kind of work that we're doing um, uh, across the entire um, uh, set of studies that this population that people are interested in. Um, uh, Kathy's own work um, uh, has been appeared in Science and Nature and, and, and um, all the demography journals, past president of PAA. Um, uh, her accolades are longer than ad health, and um, uh, we're just really pleased to have her here today. So please welcome Kathy Harris from Science. Thank you, everybody. Can everybody, oh, oh you, I'm, I'm mic'd up. I'm double mic'd up, so I don't have to ask if you can hear me. Um, yeah, they, you know, I should uh, also uh, uh, do a shout out to Jim. I mean, the, um, I'm, I was a second year assistant professor when I joined Ad Health, and Jim was a graduate student, and those were pretty heady days um, uh, developing the network data in particular. Um, so I've got a bunch of slides. I'm going to actually, I, hold on a second here. Yeah, I have an outline of what I'm going to cover. Uh, talk a little bit about the design of Ad Health, uh, the unique network data that you're probably already familiar with, and then how that has led to some of the main IRB issues uh, and um, all of our sorts of um, thoughts and strategies in terms of dealing with the security risks in the dissemination of the data, um, the security protocols we came up with, the data sharing plan, um, and then sort of successes and where we are right now. But I should say that <coughs> you can interrupt me anytime um, with questions. So um, you know, that would be fine. Maybe I'll just stop at some, um, at some points and see if there are any questions. So uh, let me start with the design. Right, so the, the new formal full name is the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. Um, and it, this is uh, now um, an ongoing program project uh, that began in 1994, uh, funded by, by NIH, so we're almost at, at um, 25 years. Um, <clears throat> we, it was developed actually in response to a congressional mandate to fund a study of adolescent health at the time. Uh, and the important part of the mandate was to understand the role of, the, of social environments um, in which adolescents live. And so that's um, how the network data became uh, very important. Um, so, you know, the original goal was really to try to put the adolescent into the context. You know, at the time there was a fair amount of research on adolescents, but it was all about the individual. Um, and so that meant that we were really missing a lot, uh, especially when you think about adolescents who are embedded you know, in families, in uh, friendship networks, and peer, larger peer networks, um, in, in schools and communities. So the original design was really um, uh, developed to try to get direct measures of those social contexts. Um, the the uh, Ad Health is a nationally representative cohort. It explores the causes of health and health behavior of adolescents and their outcomes in young adulthood. I'll show you it's a multi-survey, multi-wave, interdisciplinary design. I'm going to focus mainly on <clears throat> the original design and how that has led to a lot of the security um, uh, issues that we were concerned about. And then I'll talk more about the longitudinal design and how the, um, the original sort of data sharing and security protocols that we came up with at wave one have held throughout the study, even though it, it continued for another 15 years and we collected all kinds of other data. Um, so again, the direct measure, measures of the social context was really the innovative aspect of the design. I'll show you that. Um, it has unprecedented race and ethnic diversity. It has an um, embedded subsample of, of um, genetic pairs. And then we've, uh, ex we have extensive biomarker collection um, across all waves. So this is the original design of Ad Health. It's a school-based design. We picked um, uh, 80 communities, eight, sorry, 80 high schools from a list of all high schools in the United States. And then we selected a feeder school to that high school 
in 80 communities. We end up with a pair of schools then in these communities. We went in to each of these schools um, in, on a particular day. We administered a very brief um, school questionnaire during one of their periods. Um, and in this questionnaire, we asked for the general information uh, about the, um, the adolescent who was self-filling it out. Um, but we also collected information on the basis of which to select special oversamples um, that are in the bottom there. We also, um, at this point, asked our adolescents to nominate their five best male friends and their five best female friends. And they had the school roster in front of them, and so they were able to just identify their friends and pick the number that was associated with them and put that number in. Um, the school administration was done on, on uh, 90,000. It was, it's a school census. Everybody who showed up that day took the, the school questionnaire. So when you aggregate up at the school level, that also gives you the school context data. Then in a, um, a second level of sampling, uh, we used the school rosters. And we selected a, um, a grade and uh, sex stratified sample. Um, and it of about 200, let me see if I can hit the right button here. So the, about 200 um, students uh, from each community, from each of those pairs of schools. Um, then uh, on the basis of, of their answers to some of the in-school um, questions, we selected oversamples. We have an, uh, ethnic oversamples, a high education black sample. These are African American adolescents with um, at least one parent who has a college degree. We oversampled Puerto Rican, Chinese, and Cuban. Adolescents, we have a disabled sample, this mainly, mainly physical disabilities that they reported on in the in-school questionnaire. This is our genetic pair sample. So um, you know, every time we uh, had a, came across a twin, we selected them. Um, so they were selected at a probability of 100%. Um, we have full sibs occur naturally in large numbers in the population. We oversampled half sibs. And then adolescents who lived in the same household but were, had no genetic resemblance. So we have a lot of adopted kids and, and foster children and so on. And then uh, we have a saturated samples. And these are uh, uh, two uh, large schools and 14 small schools in which rather than sampling from the school rosters, we just interviewed all of the students in these schools. Um, and these schools are, are, are valuable because they give us the complete social the, uh, networks in the school as well as the um, sexual networks, and, and I'll tell you why in a second. So that's the wave one sample design. Um, and what, this is the contextual data that we are able to get. Um, so we, you know, I mentioned the, um, the peer networks come from the nomination of, of friends, and I'll show you that, um, as well as the nomination of romantic partners. Uh, the school context comes from the in-school questionnaire, both the aggregate, but who also interviewed the school administrator. Um, the family context uh, comes from, uh, we um, also interviewed one of the parents, primarily the mother of the adolescent at wave one. Um, and we also have a lot of information on SIBs as well as the embedded sibling sample. And then the neighborhood data comes from geocoding the addresses of the um, adolescents uh, where they lived and then merging in uh, um, contextual data <clears throat> at multiple levels. So at the block group, the census tract, the county, um, the state, um, and we also have RUCA codes now. So this includes census data, but uh, lots of other types of data. Um, we have um, STD prevalence rates that come from the CDC. We have crime rates that come from, at the county level, uh, <coughs> that come from the um, crime statistics. Uh, we have religious denomination uh, measures and, and so on. Let me see if I should stop. So. Um, OK, let me mention the, the network data, and then I'll see if you have any questions about the design. So, so as I mentioned, in the in-school administration, uh, we have uh, nominations of their five best male and five best female friends. Um, and then in the wave one in-home interview, so the in-home interview is the, um, the subset of adolescents that we sampled from the school rosters. Uh, that comes to. 20,745, so that's our sample size at wave one. And this was an in-home interview 
that was you know, much longer, 90 minutes long, um, interviewer administered, uh, where we collect more sensitive data than we did in the in-school setting, for example. Um, so in that um, in-home interview, we ask our adolescents to nominate their sexual and romantic partners. Um, again, they, they pick the, um, the name from um, a, a school roster and a number, or if they're not in the school, they just list the name. Uh, we also ask them, uh, our respondents, to nominate their best friend in wave one and wave two. And then in the saturated schools, um, we ask the adolescents to nominate their five best male and five best female friends, as well as their sexual and romantic partners. Um, so these are all the network data that are available. Um, at wave three, and I'll get to that a little bit later on, but we um, have a, um, a couple sample where um, we had the ad health uh, respondent at that time, which is wave three, they were 18 to 26, and um, we had an algorithm within the interview program that um, if they were in a relationship, um, they were randomly selected to recruit their partner. Uh, we had quota samples, 500 dating, 500 cohabiting, and 500 married. Um, and they would recruit their partner to take the exact same wave three interview. So we have this couple samples, very valuable, 500 dating, cohabiting, 500 cohabiting, 500 married, um, in which both members of this couple take the entire wave three sample and also provide the biospecimens at that time. And then one of the last things we did in terms of providing network data is um, we, um, at wave three, we asked whether or not uh, the um, respondent had contact with their, and I have their, I have in here, potential wave one friends. Um, and we only asked that of the respondents who were in grades seven and eight from wave one. So wave three, um, the sample was, you know, five to six years older. Uh, so for the most part, they were finished with high school. Um, so we only asked those who were most recently finished f from high school, you know, whether or not they had had contact with their previous friends, you know, sort of to try to get at some of the stability. Now, because of our security protocols, we could not list the names of the friends that they told us they had at wave one. Little tricky thing, and you'll see that's because we told them that we would never know that. Um, so, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not that we never know that, but we would never, you know, as soon as the interview was over, we would separate their identity from anything that they reported to us. So, you know, we, you know, through our security plan, which is quite involved because, it, you know, it forces us to go out of the country and make those linkages and then come back, we certainly can do that. Um, but we thought that you know, our, that our respondents would say, hey, how come you know my friends when you told me you would never know that? So what we did was uh, we actually asked Jim to use an algorithm, you know, knowing who their friends were, I mean, just the characteristics of their friends, um, to create an algorithm that would um, come up with a list of friends who were like the ones that they did select. So some of them were probably the ones they did select. That's what, you know, um, and some were not. And so that way they were presented with a list of friends who um, were not all exactly the same as the, the ones that they nominated. These, so these are the network data that we have. Um, the, the nominations of the five best male friends and five best female friends um, comes from the in-school questionnaire. You know, that's the richness of the network data. Um, but remember that we sampled from the in-school sample at a rate of about um, one to four, it was two to nine. Um, and so not all of their friends become part of the wave one interview, except for the, you know, the saturated school. So that's a little confusing perhaps. Um, let me see, what, are there any questions at this point about the design, where, you know, where we are at this point? Okay. Um, so here's what, this is what we asked, wave one friendship nominations. Um, so version A is for respondents who were asked to nominate up to five male and five female friends. Um, so this is wave one in home, so this is only for the saturated schools. 
We say, okay, please tell me the name of your five best male friends, starting with your best friend, with your best male friends. So the first nomination is always their best friend, so that allows us to differentiate that. Obviously, if it's female, um, we uh, say if you have a boyfriend, list him first. So that's how we identify the romantic pair. Um, you know, if not, just begin with your best male friend. So then version B is in the in-home interview wave one, non-saturated schools, which is most everybody. About 3,000 adolescents are part of the, the saturated schools. The next question is about your friends. First, please think of your best male friend. What's his name? OK. So some examples, a little bit more about the data. <clears throat> this is just a great example that I use everywhere um, that shows what you can do with these data. Um, these are, can you see okay? Uh, so this shows the, you know, the, the friendship connections um, coming from uh, one of Jim's um, articles. Uh, and you know, these um, you know, differentiate the, uh, the ties um, according to race um, and um, ethnicity is race. So the, uh, the yellow dots are white, the green dots are black, and the, um, the red dots are, are mixed or other race. Um, and you know what you see, of course, is um, you know a not not surprising stratification of friendship ties by race and ethnicity, um, and the two you know the two different clumps are represent the the junior high feeder school and the high school. Um, this is quite you know appealing picture to show um, you know some of the descriptive information that we get out of the peer data. This just shows you what the race and ethnic distribution is. I mean, because we oversampled some of the um, race um, and ethnic groups, we've, we, can, we can really break the sample down into nine different groups and analyze them separately, um, at least based on wave one. Uh, and these, this shows the, I mean, these are the actual numbers that you have to work with. Oh, man, I must have overused it. Oh, I got it. And then these, this is the weighted percent. Uh, we just have a, you know, a few based on race ethnicity. You know, race ethnicity becomes very complex when you allow your respondents to uh, indicate multiple um, categories. Um, and I should say also that these numbers, you know, we have a, an oversample of immigrant adolescents as well. Um, in 1995. Um, the national representation of adolescents and immigrant families is about, was, was about one out of five um, in first or second generation. But because we oversampled um, Chinese, Puerto Rican, and Cuban, we actually end up with about one out of um, four of the adolescents come from an immigrant family. So you can even break down uh, the uh, immigrant generation within these groups and do some interesting analysis. Because we oversampled, the genetic oversample also gives us really nice diversity in terms of family structure um, that I'm showing you here. Uh, you, um, you, know, we, you know, as I said, because of the um, you know, unrelated, we have a lot of kids you know, who come from adoptive, live with adoptive parents. You're able to break down uh, step families into you know, whether the mom was the bio mom or the dad was a bio. We had six, over 600 kids who live with single fathers another really interesting group, and then almost 1,500 who are in surrogate parent families. So these are uh, families in which um, adolescents do not live with any biological parents. So they're living with grandparents or aunts or uncles or older, um, older siblings or um, in foster homes, group homes. A lot of diversity there. And I thought I'd just put up this little um, tidbit to show you know, I mean, we're really getting ahead of ourselves here, but uh, this is a paper that just came out um, in PNAS that, that shows uh, use of the, um, um, the network data uh, in uh, which we have uh, since um, collected genetic data, um, GWAS data, which is um, genome data um, uh, and on individuals, and makes use of the fact that some of the friends that were nominated in the in-school questionnaire appear in the in-home uh, sample, and we're following them across all the waves, so that when we collected genetic data, we were collecting genetic data on the adolescent respondents, we were also collecting it on some of their friends. Um, and there's a great interest uh, in 
Um, I mean, the, the whole purpose of collecting biological data in ad health, I mean, this isn't the topic, of course, um, as well as genetic data is, um, uh, is to try to isolate and understand the role of, of the social environment and social factors in biological processes and in genetic um, relationships. Um, and so what, what we did here was to try to um, understand what's now being called social genetic effects, it's the extent to which the genes of your friends influence your own behavior and your own outcomes. Um, and so here what we show is that <clears throat> this is looking at the, um, I mean, so boy, I'm really taking some shortcuts here, but um, you know, looking at across the whole genome, you can create an index that represents a propensity for you know, all the genes that seem to be related to like education um, and all the genes that are related to BMI and height. Uh, this gray bar shows the relationship between um, your own uh, genes for education and uh, your years of education. So obviously that's, that's you know, that's, that's important. Um, the, uh, without getting into a lot of detail, the blue bar uh, shows the effects of your friend's genes on your own education controlling for your own genes. So over and above what your own genes determine in terms of education, how much do your friend's genes matter? Well, it's really, it's quite a bit for education. And then this is schoolmates, you know, which is even more important than, than grades, which has more to do with selection into schools, clustering at the school level than it, than it does with actually the schoolmates. Um, but what's important here is that for education, your friend, these social genetic effects are, are, are pretty important. Um, they're not, not near as important for height, right? It makes sense. Why would your friend's genes for height influence your own height, right? Controlling for your own genes for height. And not quite as important for BMI. So that's just a little thing that I, that's, that's pretty cool um, that, that you can do with these data. Okay. Okay, now, now to the nitty gritty. Uh, the only way that you can do these cool things with the data is if you do these, uh, pay uh, close attention to the IRB is issues. So here's some of the issues that we came up, uh, that we were um, uh, needing to pay attention to. Obviously, protecting the confidentiality of your respondents' identities sort of goes with every study. Uh, protecting the confidentiality of friendship and partner nominations. Wow, that's a, that's a little different. Uh, minimizing deductive disclosure risks, and I, I'm going to talk about each of these. And then all three of these sort of combined with the wide dissemination of, of highly sensitive data. I mean, these three things are really easy to take care of if you're not going to disseminate the data widely. Right? You know, or you, know, you only give it to one person and watch, you know, and, and you know, monitor their use, uh, and then give it to another person. OK, so motivation for data sharing. I mean, adult is very expensive. Um, it's <clears throat> national representation. That's really important because that's the basis on which policy recommendations, you know, can hold across the whole country, um, you know, rather than to a community sample or a selective sample. Anything, any implications of the research really only relates to that population. Um, the design it was really offered so many different opportunities um, uh, uh, to many different disciplines in terms of the things that they cared about, you know, the content of the data, the design of the data, sorting out causal effects, and so on. Um, and so on. I mean, you know, the rest you understand. Uh, the, the last point is that we, we actually had a policy that Ad Health um, uh, brokered with NIH that uh, said that there was no proprietary period for investigators, which meant that the day that we got the data, um, the rest of the world um, should be getting the data as well. Um, and the point is, is that, I mean, Ad Health at the time in 1994 was the most expensive social, um, the most expensive grant ever given to um, uh, social science. It was 25 million. Um, to date, uh, we're over probably about 100 
in 20 million. Um, but that's, you know, we've now done four or five waves in addition to this. So really strong motivation for data sharing on everybody's part, on, on our part as investigators, on NIH's part as funding, funding us. So what were some of the special concerns? The, you know, the contextual nature of the data um, made it, um, uh, it made it at a very high risk for deductive disclosure, and I'll go through that. Um, the other um, special concerns were the third party nominations of friends and the third party nominations of the romantic sexual partners. We never got consent from these nominated partners. So remember, we're interviewing an adolescent. We're saying, OK, tell us your romantic partner. They give us the name. You know, we don't keep that name. But, and then we ask them every single thing that you could possibly ask about that relationship with that person. And that person doesn't know anything about it, except that they're probably also taking the survey. Um, but this was the thing that worried us the most. Um, and when we came up with this plan, it wasn't overnight. It was, it was probably a year, year and a half of talking about these issues every day, worrying about, about this. And we um, were often coming up with uh, scenarios of, you know, that the father of the adolescent who was being interviewed didn't like the boyfriend and, you know, was going to wait outside for the interviewer to come out and finish the interview and hit the interviewer over the head and grab the laptop and figure out, you know, what his daughter said in response to the questions about the boyfriend. Um, we were always coming up with these kinds of scenarios and then trying to figure out ways to protect that. And I should say the way we protected against that was the minute that the interview was over um, and the interviewer closed everything down, they would hit the button and say, this is complete. And at that point, all the identifying information, the name, the address, was stripped out. And all of the responses, and that, and that was sent to our security manager, which is out of the country, and all the responses were sent to our field contractor. So they were separated at that point. So even if the father grabbed the laptop, wouldn't have been able to get it. <laughs> I mean, people thought, you know, we were crazy. And uh, probably, but it allowed our staff to sleep at night. <laughs> um, other concern, geocodes, you know, geocode is a better identifier of a person than their name. Right? Um, the very sensitive nature of the data, of course, you know, adolescent. Um, and then, of course, every time we added data, it just made, made security risks increase. Here's the pledge of confidentiality that we gave to our respondent. Uh, um, at, at, and you know, so this was the consent form. I understand that they signed this, that my statements and answers will be completely protected so that no one will ever be able to connect my answers to me. So it's that sentence that made us say, wait, wait, we can't like, present them with the list of friends that they nominated at wave one and said, oh, here's a list of friends. Um, that would have been an interesting experiment to see who remembered that. But um, we're going to take that chance. Uh, my answers will not be given to my parents, to guardians, you know, anyone unauthorized. Um, okay, so the two major risks are um, direct disclosure, uh, and that's just a link between the name and the questionnaire information. You know, it kind of rarely happens. I mean, you almost never come across a data set that has names, or <laughs> you'd be really surprised when you do when you see it. Um, but uh, that's pretty easy to protect against. You just you know deconnect that. The deductive disclosure is when you can discern a, a respondent's identity and their responses through known characteristics of that person. Um, so ad health was is at especially high risk of deductive disclosure because of the cluster design. Right? Um, so you know, remember, we were in schools. And everybody in that school knew about ad health. You know, the school administrators, the parents, all the parents you know, received consent forms. Um, all the teachers, everybody. We figured out that about almost 400,000 people knew of the participation of at least one, if not more, of the adolescents in that health. So uh, here's an, an example, and you know, you could, you know, it's very easy to do these in more than 90,000 cases. You know, really, it only takes five variables to distinguish as few as seven, you know, respondents. Uh, you know, we start with gender. Obviously, that's you know, breaks it in half, age, race, 
does not live with a father figure, participates in chorus. And you can see how easy this would be, especially like, you know, especially mixed race, especially the unusual uh, family um, living arrangements and so on. So, you know, we had these, we were doing these things. I mean, I don't know if Jim remembers, we were doing this on a regular basis and being scared to death, you know, how easy it was. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very easy. Um, okay, so here's what we came up with. We got uh, data security procedures. We came up with a management uh, security plan that protects against the breach of confidentiality from both direct and deductive disclosure. Um, it also protects against subpoena or ho or hostile sharing, which you know uh, is always possible. We also have a certificate of confidentiality. Um, so let me see what's next here. Yeah, so, okay, so I go through each of these. D direct disclosure, pretty straightforward. You separate this out. And that's when I talked about, you know, when you finish the interview, they're stripped apart. Um, the name and the addresses go um, with an honest broker. So an honest broker is somebody who has identities but has no research data. Um, ours is outside the US. Um, it's been that way since 1994. You know, I should say that it makes it very difficult. You know, it really adds difficulty in terms of fielding, you know, fielding new waves of data, checking on things. And, you know, we've been doing this for 25 years. Our adults are now in their 30s. You know, I'm thinking about bringing this back into the U.S. Um, uh, the, uh, having it, um, the only time that we have the identifying information is when we're collecting data, you know, but that doesn't come to us, it doesn't come to me. It goes straight to our um, field contractor. So I still don't really know the names, I don't know, know anybody. We use all kinds of different identification numbers for the different types of data, I'll show you that. So these names really are, are sort of never, never connected to the data. Is there a question? Okay, yeah. Can we actually ask about that and the sure. um, de-identification that happened right after the interview yeah. and then linking the data subsequently in the network? Was there a, an identifier that you created? Oh, sure, of course. Yeah, um, right. So we have this, uh, it's called AID. Um, and so as soon, you know, uh, when they're, uh, actually, I'm going to show, show you a slide, but um, they have a survey ID. And that survey, survey ID is uh, linked to a, another ID that we keep separate from the survey. So we keep it separate from our survey contractor. Um, so as soon as we separate out the data, then the responses are um, a link to that um, survey ID. And then our field contractor like cleans it, checks it, gives it to us. And then we just say, then we take, we, we uh, substitute the survey ID with an AID. And then that's the, that's AID is what they keep for, it was actually adolescent ID that they keep forever for linking data across waves. So it's really done by this ID transformation, yeah. So things go wrong, you know, sometimes the survey, you know, the survey ID gets lost or ripped off, you know, certain pages. I mean, it's, it's complicated. We definitely added complication to us. Um, for, for this, the security plan actually cost a million dollars in just terms of implementing it, designing it, enlisting other people in it. And you have to remember too, this was done in 19, this is the mid 90s. Nobody knew anything about deductive disclosure then. All of the surveys usually have a cluster design and are subject to dis deductive disclosure risks. Not, not to the extent of ad health, but you know, so we were kind of the first people saying, trying to, you know, we, we had to educate the IRB. You know, we said, well here, we have to, you know, everybody uses our data has to make sure that their security plan minimizes deductive disclosure, blah, blah, blah. They said, oh no, it's just secondary data. It's fine, it's exempt. And we, and we basically had to say, no, you have to learn what deductive disclosure is and make sure that this plan, so you know, a lot of it was educating the IRB. We probably, you know, now of course, they know all about it, but um, yeah, yeah, it was new. Okay, uh, how are you doing? Oh. Yeah, I just had to go to the next, next slide. So here's the IDs. I mean, this comes from wave four. 
so it's complicated because we're using more data. But um, so I said it was a survey ID, but it's a field ID here. Um, we also have a biospecimen ID, um, and then we collected cortisol. We had a separate cortisol ID. Then we have a household ID because of our embedded um, uh, genetic sample. Some of them are clustered in households. Um, we um, asked anyone who had ever served in the military if they would give us their social security number and then link to their military, re military records. So they had a military ID. Um, and then the question um, for ID was separate. Uh, and then a school ID was used. And that just, keep, you know, that, we just keep that from, from wave one. That allows us to identify the cluster from which this respondent came from. So this is, that's, that's how we do it. OK. Um, OK, so deductive disclosure, the thing we worry about the most. Um, so the way that we handled this was we decided that we would have this tiered data dissemination plan. And it would just, we would disseminate the data depending on the level of risk of deductive disclosure. And I should say that other studies now base their, their dissemination plan on ad health, um, LA fans. Uh, uses this and one other one recently. Um, so, uh, you know, depending on the degree of uh, risk for deductive disclosure and sensitivity of the data, we have just different requirements for access and level of security. Um, and the users must, must, re must meet these um, requirements and then agree to safeguard um, the data um, and also to abide by the procedures. And then, um, you know, access to all of the data, and I'll show you what these tiers are. Um, um, you, you can have access to all of the data through um, a restricted data use contract. Okay, so, okay. So here are the four tiers. First is public use. Now, the public use data is just, you know, um, is just on a CD. You just have to sign a pledge of confidentiality. This was like this was one of the major breakthroughs that we came through all this brainstorming. Is how could we, you know, there's no data that you know everybody has a different definition of what you would consider sensitive data, right? Um, you know the co cognitive scores. You know we you know we spent weeks discussing you know whether or not we should just disseminate that. So finally, and, and, and there, was just no, there was no way that we could take away that threat of using five variables to identify somebody. So the only way that we came up with that is to not release the full data. So the public use is a 50% sample of ad health. Um, so it's, um, it's, actually, it's, the, um, it's actually the core sample plus the um, oversample of um, high SES African American families um, with limited contextual data. So it's about 6,000 cases, which is about half of the core sample, which was about 12,000. And then when you add in the special samples, that's what takes you up to 20,745. So that's what the public use data is. The theory is that. If you really thought, you know, if a boyfriend really wanted to find out the answers that his girlfriend gave to questions um, and they could identify them, you know, the, uh, through characteristics, they would never know for sure if they really had, if he really had his girlfriend, right? Because it's only 50% sample. That was the whole logic behind that. And then we go into restricted pairs data. Uh, at, the, at the lowest level, we, we allow um, all the data. But we do not include romantic pairs. Uh, at wave three, we collected um, saliva to for, uh, test for HIV. And so we don't release, release the HIV at this level. Uh, the high security restricted data um, allows access to the romantic pairs, HIV data, you know, all the data. And then the fourth level is uh, when you do have to come into a data, a secure data facility that we have at, at CPC. And that's uh, for analyzing the high school um, transcript data. And for using, we don't release geocodes, but we do have them here. And if people want to link um, contextual data to the geocode, you know, by the geocoded information, then that's where you would do that. Um, and you would do that through an ancillary study, through an ancillary study sort of approval from Ad Health. Um, and then we have the genome-wide data. We have a, a secure 
a particular server just for that. So these are the four levels of, of the tiers, and that's what allowed us to release all the data. OK, questions there. And so this is a question more about ethics. So did you have a report back of um, the HIV test to yeah. respondents? Yeah, the HIV, and we also tested for STIs, and we reported those results back. We, we, uh, well, we tested for um, uh, syphilis, gonorrhea, um, HIV, and all of those had um, FDA-approved tests, and those were the results that we uh, reported back. Syphilis, gonorrhea. Uh, trichomoniasis was not FDA-approved at that time, and so we did not report that back. And also HPV. Um, we did it in a, um, you know, they had to call, you know, we left a, a number and they had to call, call in. The HIV results, I mean, the really good news is that, I mean, this is the only national study who tested, has tested for HIV. So, and these obviously were peak ages for HIV, um, you know, 18 to 26. Um, and the good news is that almost nobody, the, the frequency was so low that you really almost can't analyze it in any significant way. Yeah. Um, obviously, we gave enormous thought to this. So have you, did you come up with me measures, maybe statistical measures, that quantify the risks associated with um, this kind of, what is called <coughs> secondary deductive um, hmm. uh, disclosure? You mean to de determine these? Well, so you can tell at this point, your, your probability of this getting um, uh, well, found out. Because I mean, yeah. there's been lots yeah. I think that I think across all of these data sets, the the risk would be the same, right? So it's really the level of the sensit it's the sensitivity of the data. So the deductive disclosure risk is the ability to which you can identify one person. So I mean, except for the public use, right? Because we have you know since it's only a fifty percent sample, you can't a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. Yeah. So I mean, it's. Um, I think. I mean, that's one of the things that that we finally came up with is that there's no strategy that can take away that risk. So the only thing that we can do is to, you know, put put these in in buckets according to the sensitivity of the data, and then add restrictions for use of it. So you can't ever really, so, one, you know, so for example, for the high security uh, restricted data, that can only be used in a room on a, a computer that is not linked to a network um, with a locked door. Um, for the restricted use data, it just has to be a secure network. I, I, sorry, a, a secure um, uh, computing setting, put it that way. So depending on the IT environment, you know, some universities have that already set up. Um, so you can't really, I mean, I think the, the risk of deductive disclosure is always, is always there. Um, and, the, and, the, and the different levels here, well, except for, I mean, the secure, I mean, obviously a geocode, and we weren't, you know, that would be, I mean, I guess maybe the way you could quantify it is to say um, you only need one variable to 100% um, identify somebody. And so that would be with a geocode. Um, but in the other buckets, you know, perhaps you need five variables or six variables. But you can always identify a person in there if you know if you know somebody who's in the data set. So it has to be coupled with that knowledge that you have to know somebody in the data set. And if you don't know anybody in the data set, sure, you can get down to a cell of one, but you don't know who that is. So you have to have that motivation, you know, that you want to actually find out. So it is a very small risk, but it doesn't matter. Because if you're in the front page of the New York Times that your data set's been hacked, we're dead. And so is research. So you see? I mean, yeah. Um, but I think the sensitivity of the data is really where we're making these um, you know, delineations between security. Um, yeah. Were you, were you going to say something, Jim? And, Well, um, so wave three, we, 
yeah, that's an interesting, so we were not, we did not have to, so for STIs, there's an HIV um, as well, there's a requirement that you have to report to the state level, um, but we petitioned that we did not have to do that um, because of our, um, you know, actually we use the uh, Certificate of Confidentiality um, pledge, and nobody has challenged us on that. If it went to court, we were told we would lose, but our t but it it was a matter of getting our field contractor on you know to agree with us that this the certificate of confidentiality would protect us and that was a little bit tricky but eventually they came around yeah um but now you know now that i mean we don't know i mean we have positive hiv results but basically in the states we don't know who that is so that would be our answer if anybody if they came to us if the if the state you know, you know public health and government came, I yeah. Just, I was just going to ask if there was any um, like censoring of really small cell sizes. So. Oh I, yeah. I do research on disabilities, and I'm thinking like if there's one kid in the high school who's in a wheelchair. Yep. You know. Yeah. So one of our so I haven't listed. You know I might um, see if I have yeah. So well, this, one of, in one of the security protocols um, as part of the contract that people enter into legally is that you will never publish anything um, using a cell of less than five. So, so the, you know, we have a list of, um, you know, of, um, of security protocols and that, that people must agree to, and that's one of them. And we sort of went, I think it was higher, I mean, you know, that's the same as the census. It's five. It seems small to me, but I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think we had 25, and then we saw the census was allowing five, so. But that's a restriction on, you can publish a publish. where if you were doing a, a bunch of um, regression and the intersection of all the cell sizes across the five, you could put the cross tab right? Exactly, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, any other, so I mean, for example, so here's, this is the, the plan, the public use, restricted data, high security restricted, and then the, and um, if you can, you probably can't, you probably can't see this, but it tells you what, what, what data you have in here. So, you know, you, there's no direct identifiers ever, right? That's easy, that takes care of direct disclosure. Um, geographic coordinates are only in the, you know, use in the secure data facility. Uh, we have neighborhood characteristics, individual characteristics, sensitive behavior, but you know some of these characteristics treated um, for disclosure protection are not included. So it kind of refers to. So that's the way we you know reduce what we thought were the risks. We you know the more c context information you have, the easier it is. So we sort of limited the contextual information at the neighborhood in the public use, um, and uh, you know so. That's across the board. Here are the, you know, the procedures, and same with B. Sen same for sensitive data. Um, but I mean, we release the biological data. We release the the disease markers, um, the candidate genes, so on. Um, so then, the, here's what you must agree to: you sign a confidentiality pledge for the public use data. And um, actually, there isn't a fee. I gotta update that. Um, and then for the restricted data, okay, here are the additional things. You have institutional contractual agreement. Basically, the, um, the vice chancellor or, or the, you know, the head of research at your institution you know, enters into um, a legal agreement that you will uh, um, you know, agree to these requirements in your use of the data. And that's really what UNC um, you know, holds. If, if there's any violation of any of these um, requirements, then that allows UNC to sue your institution. So, I mean, that's never, it's never happened. I mean, every user, you know, is um, more than, you know, willing to, I mean, every user wants to protect the confidentiality. Um, so it's really, you know, it's a, it's a very sort of small, um, you know, a nefarious, you know, Handful of, of um, access to the data that we're that we're trying to avoid here. Um, so we have the contractual um, agreement, 
uh, you know, a proposal about what you want to do, a security plan. You have to you know, say, how are you going to access the data? Is the data going to be on an external hard drive? Is it going to be on a secure network? You know, what, are the, um, uh, what are the parameters of that? All that has to be entered into a, a security plan. You pretty much need an IT person, but if you don't have one at university, then we can help you uh, sign pledges. And then you need IRB approval of your security plan so that they know and they feel that that will uphold to the requirements that we're asking. Um, we also have site visits. Um, we come and uh, um, uh, you know, visit our users at uh, different locations to review the security plan and make sure that, um, that they are being upheld. Um, what we find in these site visits is that almost nobody is doing exactly every single thing that they said, but not on purpose. They just don't know. So they're so grateful you know, when we come and say, oh, you know, if you just did this differently, you know, then that would put you in compliance with your security plan. Uh, we do charge a fee for the, the con contractual data. And that money, I mean, it's not that much. I think with all the waves, including wave five, which just came out, it's $1,000. Um, and that's the money that we use to then do the site visits and also hold a, a user's conference. So the, these are kind of, you know, this is basically, the, 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 the uh, restricted data contract is on our website, so you could look it up there um, if you're interested. So let me see, we're doing okay on time. Um, oh, okay, all right. So these are the other requirements, um, you know, the pledge of confidentiality, monitoring data use, uh, storing the data securely, um, you're not allowed to share share the data. You, you can be the only user of the data. Um, we ask that you delete temporary files every six months. Just don't have them hanging around. Um, security of the printed information. Uh, have a password protected. Um, and access only from approved locations. So these are all the kinds of things that you would um, agree to uh, in your in your use. Um, so, like you know, the deletion of temporary data files every six months. Um, so that's that's an example. If we did a site visit, you know, we might you know we say, okay, well, let's see, let, let me see your storage of files, and we see they've been there for two years. So that's a pretty straightforward thing. Um, and actually, I mean, when this first happened, I said, you know, this is just a big pain that we have to, you know, delete these files, and you just you know you delete them actually. At CPC, so we're the only ones that are probably perfectly compliant with our own, you know. And so my files would be gone. I'm like, oh God, you know. And then next day, you just have to recreate them all. Um, and so that's why it's good to be a data user when you're also running a study. <laughs> and uh, it used to be every three months. So you know, the the issue for this is really if you construct variables, you can construct those variables and put them in a constructed data file. Those don't have to be deleted, all right? Um, and so, you know, there are ways to work within our um, security protocols that are more feasible, you know, when you're a data user. I mean, you know, at one point on the study, I mean, I was, you know, I mean, Jim, you and I probably were the only data users, you know? Um, so, you know, we, we try to, uh, you know, the, the, the problem is, and I, I guess you know by now, uh, I mean, um, or I guess most recently has really come to light, is just how easy it is to hack into systems. I mean, the reason why we want these things deleted is because you can easily come over the wire, you know, and, and find some data. I mean, we know that happens, you know, and, and they might want to say, oh, look at this interesting data. I wonder what it is. Well, if they somehow find out it's ad health data and they come across you know, STI results or um, uh, what else would be, you know, um, you know, reports of illegal behavior. Um, you know, that might be, I mean, in this day of age, of course, that wouldn't be very interesting given everything else that's going on. But, um, you know, those are the things, and, and every month they're changing. So we have our IT person who we send them to the SANS Institute and they find out what are the top 10 threats. You know, and it's usually published by, by the FBI, and then we come back and try to make sure that we're covered for those threats. Um, oh, oh gosh. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's what we did at the beginning. So I'll just quickly you know, add, I mean, this is really just for your information about the rest of Ad Health. Um, but those were the main sort of IRB issues. That's what we came up with. That's what we implemented in the, in the um, 
uh, mid to late 90s, and everything was working. And then we, then we collected all the other data. So here's the, you know, in wa at wave two, we, um, one year later, we went back and we interviewed the adolescents um, who were in grades seven through 11. So we did not follow up the seniors at wave two, uh, which is why the sample size went down a little. I mean, that was just cost. Um, and I should say, I mean, just there's like a million anecdotes that are kind of interesting, but since we were asking about the STI results, we had actually planned to collect saliva um, and urine and test for STIs and HIV at wave two in adolescence, um, because Ad Health was planned to only be a five-year project, just adolescence. It was only supposed to be the in-school administration, the wave one, and wave two, and that was going to be it, and the you know, parent. Um, and so we pre-tested that collection, and our field contractor, you know, at the time, remember this is 1995, they weren't too crazy about collecting urine and saliva. Um, and so they, they sort of sabotaged it, you know, in the pre-test. They just didn't like doing it. You had to like, first catch urine, and, you know, we would get urine samples back with nothing in it, or, you know, they weren't packaged right, and they'd all, fill, you know, spilled out. And, and because of what Jim mentioned about the reporting at the state level of these results, we are, our plan was that we would collect these data, and then we would assay the results, and then we would destroy the identifiers. But that was it, you know, destroy them, so that we wouldn't have to report, which sounds pretty draconian, but again, this is just a five-year project. But because the interviewers kind of screwed it up in the pretest, we said, OK, well, maybe we, we can't do this. It's not going to work. And so just because of that, we didn't destroy the identifiers, and we still have a study today. And then we did it at wave three. That was kind of a interesting. Um, so wave three then was about five years later. They were 18 to 26. We, fought, we, went, we went after everybody at wave one. We always, we always go back to the original respondents now, um, just for representativeness. Uh, we got about 85% of the parents at wave one. This is the partner, the couple sample I mentioned, dating, cohabiting, and married uh, couples. Um, and then wave four was in 2008. Now they're really settling into adulthood. They're 24 to 32. We got a, you know, a little bit better response rate because they're settling down, they have jobs, they have a credit record. Um, this IIV study is a study where we got repeat um, biomeasures, biological specimens um, on 100 people so that we could check for the reliability of these measures. That's why we threw out the cortisol, it just wasn't reliable. Um, and now we're in the field right now with wave five. Um, we're going, you know, after the wave one, they're moving through their 30s, and we also have a parent uh, uh, follow-up of the parent study. That's, um, that's just about done. Here's all the biological data, again, just for your information. And we've got, you know, we had height and weight across all the waves. We picked up waste at four, and now we're doing that at five. Here are the STI tests and the HIV. Uh, we got genetic data on the... Um, uh, the genetic pairs, uh, it was twins and full sibs, so it was about 2,500 uh, pairs at wave three. Um, and that was really to look at sort of candidate gene and gene-environment interactions, pretty simple stuff, you know, back in 2000, uh, early 2000. And then wave four, we really expanded our measures, and we thought, okay, you know, we can um, get some really nice health measures. At this point, there were new methods coming out. We used blood spots. Um, to get the measures of inflammation. We collected blood pressure for cardiovascular. This is when we got genetic data on everybody. And then we're repeating this in wave four. We're picking up some measures of for kidney disease. Um, you know, again, I mean, just for your information. Um, you know, and the strength of Ad Health is really the, you know, bringing the social and the bio together. Um, that's, a, that's a common approach of a lot of studies. But there's no study that have this level of, the, of environmental data. Um, in that health, which, you know, the, the design really made us incredibly strong here. As you go out in time, you have selection into environments, but we still, you know, we have, we collected all the college, names of colleges, and we've merged in characteristics there, and we keep, we keep up very, you know, good measures of family and, and clearly neighborhood and community data. Um, so this original data sharing plan really has 
been able to accommodate these additions of pretty sensitive data, um, which, I, which I've mentioned. Um, you know, every time we think about the genetic data, or sorry, we have the additional data, we say, well, is it more sensitive? But, you know, and, and I think really it's, you know, you, you know, entering into a legal contract with users and, and reminding them of the protocols that they need to follow is the only thing that we have to stand on, at, you know, at the end of the day. Um, identifying the risks, educating users about the risks, and then having them abide by our protocols is really what makes it work. Um, so all of this has worked well. Uh, Oh, I guess I have some additional information. This was the question that uh, the Moody algorithm uh, of the 10 p potential friends. Um, and then this is what we, once we showed them those friends, we asked them, please indicate which of the following people um, who went to your school or your friends now or were your friends. And then we asked this information. So I thought this was a good slide to, to uh, present to uh, a group of people interested in, in network data since I don't think these data have been exploited near to the extent that, um, I that love using data. it allows. It's an awesome opportunity to look at <laughs> you have these people who, by all intents and purposes, should be your friends, some of whom were, some were. And the way you cite the ability to do is cross classification of the effects of fictive friends, right? If you think about the selection effect idea, right. it's a really nice way to do it with these and see if you think these same models will work out. And then the stability issue. Yeah, stability, and you know, and you can figure out according to the I, you know, it's IDs would, that would tell you whether or not this is the same friend that was nominated back in adolescence. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I mentioned you just trying to keep up in terms of the technological advances in data access, hacking, and intruding. You know, we, we receive the information from the SANS Institute, which, um, you know, keeps us on top of what the, oh, I said 10 top threats. I guess it's the, the 20 top threats. Um, yeah. We've been really successful in getting the data out. Uh, we have more than 50,000 researchers um, around the world, uh, many, many additional grants um, to analyze the data. Um, over 3,000 peer-reviewed publication articles, and that, that comes to about, uh, we've been really excited when we figured out this metric, that there's a new article based on ad health that's published every day of the work week, <laughs> uh, and so on. It's really cool. Um, here's, you know, I mean, this is what it looks like around the world. We've got a lot of users everywhere. Um, these are the users in the United States, kind of looks like our distribution of respondents, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, this is really, you know, I think I've probably communicated how time consuming it is, and there's a lot of demands. Um, and, you know, the, the customized approach to um, our users who are, you know, don't have the resources in terms of IT, we try to help, help as much as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, so this actually is more like a you know an advertisement for what's what's coming ahead. Um, you know we've we've you know, been working with the genetic data that's done. We um, we we have a grant to get gene expression data, that's just starting up now. Uh, we we'd love to get microbiome data. We have a grant in for that. Administrative records, especially going forward on this cohort, would be terrific. Um, we are uh, collecting the death records for those who have died. It's only about 300, 350 uh, individuals. Um, and we're collecting actually birth records on the respondents, starting with the six um, states, starting with six states that have, uh, you know, many of our respondents. Um, that's also been really hard, um, just dealing with these state level um, talk about resource poor administrative vital statistics offices but we're making we're making progress i think that might be it um yeah i just let me i have some information about ancillary studies but that's that's probably end up with the website and if there's any other questions happy to take them
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm not collecting on the data, but I'm curious, <coughs> having seen all this kind of uh, as a, I guess like a gold standard, um, do you have any reflections on other studies that, and how they've been done, or even frankly Facebook or other social media? How they deal with uh, um, data? Yeah, I mean, uh, you mean thoughts about people who are using like Facebook and? Or how they collect and, and secure data or? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think the thing about other studies is that I, most of most national studies use some type of design that's clustered, and they call it maybe a, P, a, a PSU, a primary sampling unit, which you know could be a county or you know like a set, and. Um, you know, so without realizing it, they, these studies really face the same risks of deductive disclosure. I mean, some of the studies don't release the PSU, but some do, you know, because it allows you, and it's even as, we actually release a dummy, you know, variable on county and um, track, you know, because it allows you to, to cluster, to identify people who share, who share that same cluster, and they might have done that. So I think that, you know, I think that um, the lot, a lot of those studies weren't really thinking about some of those deductive disclosure risks. So I think Ad Health, you know, sort of changed the landscape. I mean, it feels like the pendulum's really swung where, you know, the IRBs, you know, people just didn't know anything about it. And now, you know, and now that they know something about it, I mean, we have a solution. It's not perfect. There's no solution. I mean, I think that's really the conclusion we came up with. There's no solution. So you have to come up with what you can live with. You know, but I think the, the pendulum swung back that, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you have to do something about this and you can't release these data. And um, so I think now there's like hypersensitivity by IRBs and others to some of these issues. But, you know, to do research, there's got to do survey research. There has to be some level of trust between, you know, the researchers and the respondents. And I, I mean, I think that's the thing is our respondents, when we explain to them what we've done, I mean, they trust us, you know, I mean, they give us their biospecimens and their, you know, genetic, I mean, our compliance rates are for, um, are 96% for um, genetics, for saliva, for genes, 95% for blood spots. I mean, people just didn't like getting their finger pricked. So I think that, you know, that's the thing is that there has to be this meat, you know, there has to be some, um, you know, common ground for feasibility to do research. And a lot of the respondents will say, yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want, I'm not going to give you my specimens or, um, and that, that's fine. You know, we'll take, you know, we want their survey data too. Um, so I, I, that would be my take that, you know, the, that the, there needs to be reasonable people and each study is different depending on the design. So, I mean, for people collecting data, you know, I mean, you really need to think through, um, you know, your design and how that, um, and what kinds of risks that, that poses for respondents. It may not be deductive disclosure. It might all just be the content, right? Um, so I think, I think the, set, the users are very sensitive now to these. You know, be, just because I think of the census, you know, these, the secure census, um, um, the RDCs, where you can analyze census data, that's far more restrictive than what than what you know we do, and so I think that users are now very sensitive to the fact that oh, you know, not everybody's data is easily accessible, and there's a reason why. Um, but I think many other studies have followed our dissemination sort of procedures. Uh, you know, um, uh, LA fans. I mean, PSID doesn't release their um, geocodes; they used to. Um, uh, same with fragile families. So, we do a lot of consulting about um, release of, you know, release of dissemination of data. Yeah. 
I mean, I have to say, you know, I mean, an interesting phenomena is that we're in the field with wave five. And like I said, our respondents are really wonderful. Um, and they, you know, they, they trust us. And then one weekend, so we've been in the field since 2016, I had three, I had four emails um, from respondents. I mean, because my name, I mean, they can find me. I'm not supposed to know them, and I, but um, asking to get out of the data. Like, they want their data out. They want their out of the study. They don't ever want to be, like, just, well, guess what weekend that was? It was Cambridge Analytica. Freaked people out. And so, you know, then we're dealing with the IRB, because that looks bad, you know, five and four in one day. Uh, well, it was four in a weekend. And so, um, you know, and you have to, and of course, you say, absolutely. You know, it's, and, um, but, I mean, we had one respondent who said, I want all of my responses ever that I gave. And she was like one of the best respondents. Wave one, wave two, wave three, gave genetic data, all the biospecimens. I want everything out. And we can't say, I, and um, so I, I can't say, I'm sorry, but I don't know who you are. And I couldn't even go into the data, me, and find who you are and take you out. So I didn't say that, because she would say, yes, you can. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, but, uh, you know, but we definitely, but she had just finished the Wave 5 interview. And I guess just had second thoughts and thought, oh my god, you know, they might know this, and blah, blah, blah. And she worked for a pharmaceutical company. She kept telling me things about her, and I'm there, no, don't tell me anything more. <laughs> you know, I don't want to know. And um, so we definitely, we took her Wave 5 out, but everything else we left in. I mean, you know, it was, I mean, and that could be an interesting question for the IRB. Um, we could, of course, you know, do it. We'd have to go back through our security system and trace back and do all those altered I IDs. Um, but that was, that was the solution. I mean, nobody is ever going, you know, to know her. Yeah. 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 That's a great question. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. Um, so we always try to clarify and say there was, there was somebody else, uh, one of the other people who wanted to be pulled out or to, to come out permanently of the study, never be contacted again. The interviewer had gone to her home. They weren't there. And so she asked a neighbor, oh, is, you know, is so-and-so here, live here? Because she was part of a health study, and I'm trying to, so the neighbor told, told the respondent, and that kind of freaked out the respondent and said, you're asking my neighbor, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so when she emailed me, she CC'd the IRB, and, I, and so that's, in that case, I said, oh, you know, this is, you know, our interviewers are trained, um, and, you know, never release any information about you, you know, your name, and, and that the interviewer did exactly what she was supposed to do. You know, I mean, we really wanted the IRB to know that, the, that this is what we've always done throughout all the, and so she was perfectly fine with that. I said, you know, but you're at, you know, we'll take you out, no problem. But she said, fine, that's great. But the other person who wanted all of her responses, so I did talk to her on the phone to try to explain the protocol, and it just, it didn't, it didn't, she didn't understand it, and so it didn't allay, allay her fears. And so it kind of made things worse. Yeah. I mean, you kind of th you think, you know, oh, OK, I can. I'm sure once I explain, you know, they'll understand. No. You know, <laughs> it just made it worse. She wanted to know how we got in the schools to begin with and, you know, things like that. I mean, you forget, this is 25 years ago. Uh, but I mean, you know, we had parental consent and adolescent consent, so. Um. All right. Is there a Wonderful things to think about, a lot of really good issues. Um, please you know, continue to, um, uh, these discussions and think about your own data collection and you know, ask us as, as you go on for the week. And <coughs> <you get> <laughs>